There's a breakfast in Post TV Africa. We're about to go through the papers this morning, uh, looking at the front pages of a national dailies. We have Chris Kende, who joins the conversation in no time. Chris, it's good to have you join us. Thank you for having me. Good morning. I'm Baraka Desala. Good morning to you, CK. All right. Happy holiday. Uh, we take a look at the Daily Independent newspaper, and the focus would be on, you know, the top stories or bold caption. Buhari not part of plot to draft Jonathan into presidential race. That's what the president says quoted to say. Buhari not part of plot to draft Jonathan into presidential race. <clears throat> it's boldly written on the Daily Independent. Away from that, you have debt toll rises to 10 in Lagos building collapse. Desist from further external borrowings. Anglican Synod advises the federal government. I mean, the fact that the church is interested <laughs> is a serious issue. If zoning is buried, Nigeria is buried. Southern Middle Belt leaders tell Northern elders. Interesting caption. We must cut down on cost of governance, says OB. Uh, Peter OB, also uh, <clears throat> a presidential aspirant for 2023. And Kaduna train attack, federal government working on safe return of abducted passengers. That's what the president himself is quoted to say. Reveals bandits are using abducted persons as shield against rescue efforts. These is, I mean, this is a practice is very common. Three killed as sit at home order holds in Anambra. These are the headlines on the Daily Independent newspaper. All right, away from the Daily Independent, we'll move on next to the Daily Tribune. The lead story for this morning, Clark Adibanjo Obioza to Nef, that's the Northern Elders Forum. Dumping zoning will kill, bury Nigeria. Other stories making headlines. World Press Freedom Day, media freedom under attack in Nigeria, say editors with a writer there. I want federal government to make... Uh, Newsprint's broadcast equipment consumables tax-free. FIFA finds Nigeria 63.9 million naira for fans misconduct after Ghana match. All right, uh, God will show the way Lawan on purported presidential ambition. I will hand over to any one Nigerians uh, elect. That's the president saying President Mohamed Buhari. Gunmen strike again in Anambra, kill policemen, six others. That's uh, the wake of um, the seat at home uh, going on there in Anambra state. Buhari tweets for the first time since federal government lifted ban on Twitter. PDP heads for appeal court over a ruling on conduct of primary election. 10Q23 rescued in Lagos three-story building collapse Train attack bandits using captives as human shield. That's according to President Mohamed Buhari. Those are the stories on the front page of the Nigerian Tribune. Away from the Nigerian Tribune, uh, let's take a look at the Nation newspaper this morning. Terrorists use captives as human shield, says President Mohamed Buhari. Uh, that's a bold caption. Underneath you have service chiefs should locate, eliminate criminals. IGP or IG deploys surveillance choppers. Away from uh, that bold caption on the nation, you also have another header saying, campaign for APC PDP presidential ticket hot up. Rescheduled debts get more loans, IMF tells Nigeria. Really, whose interest? Uh, do you have this conversation? I mean, really, we have to deal with IMF for a very long time until we understand that we don't need to. Lagos collapse building, 10 dead, 23 rescued. Nigeria loses 5.04 trillion naira annually to headache pharma conflicts. Disqualified PDP presidential aspirant face panel today. And I'm sure you want to find out the outcome. National Assembly workers serve strike notice over wage. At a time where you, I mean, we just celebrated Workers' Day. It's a lot uh, to talk about. But these are the headlines on The Nation this morning. Finally, we'll take a look at the leadership newspaper. 
Despite PMB's marching orders to service chiefs, many Nigerians still trapped in captivity, a bandit prowl the north with several riders there. 1,908 kidnapped, 4,233 killed between January and April this year. Gunmen behead military couple in Imo. We are working on safe return of kidnapped victims. The president is quoted in that. Be ruthless on bandits, terrorists, army chief orders troops. More stories are World Press Freedom Day, media freedom under attack in Nigeria. According to editors, PDP postpones NEC meeting, the first decision on zoning till May the 10th. Border reopening, importers' agents recount losses of two-year closure. My presidential ambition, mere speculation, says Lawan, death toll in Lagos building collapse rises to 10. State of the nation can declare three-day prayers, cautions, politicians. And uh, let's see, uh, I think those are all the stories on the front page of the leadership newspaper this morning. Mm. Um, let's have Chris Kane want to join the conversation this morning. We'll start off with the Daily Independent newspaper. Now, Chris, on the Daily Independent newspaper, I mean, the presidency is responding to the allegation, if you like to say, uh, that's been put out that the president has a support. I mean, it's part of the plot to ensure that good luck Jonathan returns to the race. Uh, but here yeah, you have the president is saying he has no reason. I mean, supporters of uh, the former president are saying that, you know, all of this has been sorted out. Well, it's good that the president is coming out to, with that um, statement uh, because over the weeks, um, a lot of people believe that um, because of the seemingly closeness of the former president, uh, Willard Jonathan, to uh, current president and the way he has been frequenting Asura, um, that is the subtle, um, support for his uh, support, uh, ambition to uh, come back to office in 2023. But personally, I would just look at those things as most green. I don't see good Lord Jonathan coming back for whatever reason. I personally feel that um, for his own integrity, personality, and whatever he really has done, I think he should just stay out of this and just enjoy his retirement. Don't forget that this same um, government since 2015 hit all his problem on good Lord Jonathan. Until today, anything that went wrong with this government, they will refer to good Lord Jonathan. Uh, if there is no fuel, they require to Jonathan. The level of insecurity is Jonathan. Economic woes is Jonathan. Lack of infrastructure is Jonathan. Division among Nigerian and ethnicity and the rest of them is good Lord Jonathan. So practically, if you are keeping the blame of an individual, like good Lord Jonathan, to be the man behind all the woes we have been seeing since 2015 to date, how come we are now also trying to cut his, um, his membership to come and fly the flag of um, the APC as it were. So all these things are shooted in, in secret, um, it, it, it shooted in secret sort of. But to me, uh, Jonathan, good Lord, Jonathan itself is not, it, it, it's not um, happy matters. Remember a few days ago when some people, uh, so-called uh, supporters, went to his office to protest. He was neither here nor there. He did say he was not contesting. He only said that he's consulting and we will get back to Nigeria as a due course. That to me um, is it, it, loaded. Um, it's, 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 that have left room for speculation, but I'm good enough that the president uh, government. The but president but, but is, let, um, let's quickly, I mean, look at this before we move away. I mean, Justin, with the other uh, people now, do you think that if the presidency or the president was in support of Jonathan's return, he would actually own up to it? Let's also not forget that. There was a time the president talked about he can't make uh, known, I mean, disclosing his favorite because, you know, whoever he might be supporting might be killed. Uh, these are some of the words that the president had put out prior to this time. And we know that sometimes with the speculative, we see uh, a lot of manifestation. So do you think that this would have been different if the president was supporting? Would he own up to you to say that yes? He's supporting Jonathan to be back in the race. There's no way the president will own up. Jonathan is not a member of the APC, I think, to the best of my knowledge. So in what way will he come out to say he supports 
a PDP member to become the presidential flag bearer of APC. That is absolutely impossible. So, except we are now told that Kumbh Jonathan has picked up membership of uh, uh, APC, but even at that, even if he decides to run, it's not going to be a, a one a race track for him. There are so many other uh, presidential aspirants uh, in the APC, so he has to go out and uh, slog it out with them for uh, for the party to pick up his presidential candidate. But for me, as I said, I believe this is just more like a diversionary and it's mostly, I don't see good luck, Jonathan, for me to contest the 2023 uh, presidential election. All right, uh, uh, CK, and let's stay with uh, the Daily Independent. Uh, there's still the talk of um, zoning. Uh, if zoning is buried, uh, Nigeria is buried. Southern uh, Middle Belt leaders tell it or tell Northern elders. There seems to be no end in sight to this issue of zoning. Do you think it will make or mar elections in 2023? Yeah, it will go a long way. Um, uh, but my own personal concern is not even whether the, what not is thinking is the attitude of the uh, leaders of the South, the uh, aspirants from the South. If there's no unity of purpose among the uh, candidates from the South, southern part of the country, as I'm seeing it now, if the South is Southwest and South South cannot come together and be able to forge a, a common force among themselves, then you can be rest assured that the presidency will go back to 2023. So it is only when those politicians in the South leave their greed and selfishness and see that there's a, a, there is the need for them to be able to forge a common force against the a, a tsunami that is coming from the north, then you will see that um, they won't be able to get it in 2020. So irrespective of whatever anybody says, zone it to us, not zone it to us, a problem is going to there. A problem is being created. And you don't know where this is coming from. Some say it's from the north east seven. Don't forget just a few days ago we heard, although it's not been associated, that even the senior president uh, Lawan Ahmed uh, will, be, will be throwing his rats in, into the ring. In the north, you already see people like Tambowa, you have seen uh, Atiku Abubaka, you have seen uh, Bala, uh, Mohammed, and uh, Saraki, and a lot of them saying that they're going to contest in 2023. That is necessary speaks volume. But in the south, what do we have? You see all sorts of rancor. If those from the southwest are not trusting those from the southeast, those from the south south don't seem to be saying all, all sorts of things against those from the southwest and southwest. So that has become the green. And we, they are only just playing into the hands of, you know, so irrespective of whatever uh, Neze or uh, Pandev or whatever says, if there is no unit of purpose among the, the, the politicians from the south, then you can rest assured that uh, the north, which is a much, much coercive, uh, very, very coherent uh, uh, group, can just decide to just go go for it. And they might just take advantage of the division within the south and get it in 2023. Let's also look at the nation. It talks about restructure or reschedule debts and get more loans. I mean, this is IMF speaking to African countries, including Nigeria. Uh, how do you react to this, juxtaposing that with the fact that if you look at our debt profile right now, we're heading towards maybe 50 trillions? Mercy, if I borrow you money, I'm going to tell you what you're going to take the money to now. Now, so. If I borrow you money, I go put my eye for the money now. I borrow, you say you come to borrow money from me or take money from me that you want to use it in um, 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 buying goods in your shop. And the next thing I see you at 101, be wearing uh, 500,000 lace. I go ask you to say, wait now, uh, you'll get my money where I am now. So that is what is happening. He who goes are borrowing, we are sorry. If we continue, as far as Africa continue to go to the IMF and International Monetary Fund, uh, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, World Bank, and other Western countries to borrow money. They will always determine what happens. And that is where we find ourselves. So for me, way to this economic reliance, ability to be able to shoulder ourselves and handle our responsibilities, as try, try as much as possible to be financially independent of most of this. But is that possible? It is not totally possible because there is no country in the world that not, even the United States borrows, but they borrow on a stand and build, use it for infrastructure. But what happens in Africa, our government borrow and use it to, to pay salaries and also to be traveling around the globe instead of investing in, in key infrastructure. That is where the problem So the IMF will always determine, try to tell you what to do. 
And if you don't do that, they just plug the, they just up the plug and you'll be in dear, terrible situation. That is the situation we find ourselves in Africa and Nigeria. All right. Uh, this one seems to be taking its impact on the nation's um, economy and, of course, uh, what we should be making, the herd of farmer conflict on the nation newspaper. The nation aptly captures it this way. Uh, Nigeria loses 5.04 trillion naira yearly to herd a farmer conflict. How does this um, hit you, CKN? It's quite unfortunate. We know this. Um, but um, I don't think it used to be what uh, I don't think the situation now is, um, is what it used to be uh, in, in few years, uh, uh, some years back. Uh, you remember what used to happen in Benue, Plateau, Taraba, uh, mo most of these uh, other states. And um, um, it was a very, very terrible situation where farmers were killed in their farm. And that um, caused a lot of, um, a lot of uh, problem, and which, especially in the North Central. Um, but I think that has really come down now. What we are facing now is banditry, kidnapping, and killings. And that part of those uh, kidnapping and banditry also involved most of these people going into the farms and kidnapping farmers and um, asking them for ransom. That in itself has um, affected the prices of um, goods and services, especially uh, uh, foodstuffs. If you know what um, the tuba, uh, the tuba of yam costs now, a bag of rice, tomatoes, vegetable, name them. It has really affected. So for me, I think it's a wake up call. Um, there's nothing that um, people is saying that is not true. You, all you need to do is throw into any of the markets near you. And you see the prices of um, uh, commodities have skyrocketed. And these are not, and it's funny enough, these are not things we import. We don't import most of these things. These are things that we grow here. So I think we should be able to, the first and foremost thing we need to do is be able to handle this issue of insecurity. Once we can handle this issue of insecurity, then um, uh, there will be a growth in our economy and most of these things we're able to uh, died down. But are we doing the needful? I don't think so. Quickly on the leadership, you also have another header that talks about border reopening as importers and agents uh, complain about or recount their loss. I mean, for almost, uh, you know, how many years now? W what do you make of this? First, what do you think about the fact that the border has been reopened? Others have queried what was the essence of closing the border? in the first instance? The question you ask yourself, where the borders actually closed? That's the question to ask ourselves. Where the borders actually closed? Yes, they may close. Uh, uh, which other one? The one uh, um, after Badagri closed and rest of them. But for every two, three, I think about, how I many you have less than 10 borders that are closed, about six or there about, you have over 1,000 borders open. So even if you close the one in Seme or the one I, uh, uh, by uh, uh, Kotunu or whatever, the one in Casino or wherever, there are still a thousand and one other routes where people import or moving um, uh, smuggled things into the country. We have one of the most porous borders in the world, and we cannot man them, and that is the thing. So, um, whether they open it or not, rice have been smoked. If you go to the markets all over Nigeria, you see smoked rice, all of them. The, what you see the custom doing is going uh, leaving their jobs that they're supposed to be and be going into people's shop and breaking that shops and trying to cut away those uh, those rights. That is not the right thing to do. That is what you should do be, be able to manage. So I believe that we should be able to equip our custom, equip the uh, NIS, Nigerian Immigration Service, and all relevant agencies that, um, uh, that, uh, that, that take care of our borders to make sure that most of these things are not uh, does get into the country. Go to most of part, part of the uh, north. Even the why the petroleum, why we have so much pressure on uh, on the prices of petrol is practically close to about thirty or forty percent of the petroleum products coming to Nigeria are taken outside the country. A small part of the that so, uh, take it to uh, Niger Republic, taken to Chad, uh, Chad Republic, Cameroon, and the rest of them through the borders and our security agencies. Most of these things. So uh, for me, it's neither here nor there whether we are closing or opening. If we don't do the right footing, then we'll continue to find ourselves in this. So why, this so why then do we have these importers and agents uh, complaining about the loss that they have experienced? So the loss they are complaining is the fact that most of these imported things is telling on their own products. If you are, if you are giving a free room for 
for such importation that things are coming in. Definitely, it's going to affect the prices of um, of goods uh, manufactured in Nigeria. So, if you're bringing a bags of rice um, that's at a very less price, most of these ships part in a Kotonu and they use the land to move it into Nigeria because they cannot move into the port. And the rice coming from Thailand, China, or whatever, it costs about eighteen thousand naira. And the one that is producing at a, at a Bakleke in a Boyin state or a KB or whatever, some of these states, and it's going for about 28,000, 27,000 naira. Which one do you think Nigerians will buy? That is the situation. That is why they are complaining that this border's um, opening is going to affect them. But what I'm saying, in essence, whether you close the border, you don't, you don't close it. People are still finding a way of bringing in most of this group. And we should find a much better way of manning these borders so that this thing can be stopped. All right, uh, Chris, today is our World Press Freedom Day. Uh, Nigerian Tribune captions this this way. Media freedom under attack in Nigeria, say editors. Let's examine how the press, um, or how free the press has been in Nigeria since this dispensation. How would you rate it? I'm a journalist. Um, if I'm to rate it, I, I would say we are not doing badly. Sincerely, we are not doing badly. Um, if we look at where we are coming from, from 1984, the days of the 4 down to the military era, um, and the, from 1999 to date, I don't think we are doing badly. We can do better. Uh, my problem has always been that access to information has become a big problem for us as journalists. Don't forget that the uh, Freedom of Information uh, Bill was passed into law. Until now, most journalists, they say it's a, a, a it was a journalist, a uh, media bill. It's not a media bill. It's a Nigerian bill. But most often than not, you say that as a journalist, if you want to use that law to be able to access information, especially within government agencies, there are so many hurdles that you have to pass that at the end of it, all, you'll not be able to do that. So I think more, so much should be done to be able to uh, make sure that uh, that the access to information is a uh, make easier for us to be able to work as journalists. Then secondly, for me, is also uh, the problem with most of the media houses, they are grappling and they are practically choking. So many of them cannot pay salaries of their uh, of, of um, journalists or our workers or our colleagues. Some are owing as much as 10 months, 11 months, 12 months salary. Some will even go, when you try to take up work with them, they say, we are giving you a, uh, a, 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 a what is it, um, an ID card, which will be a meat ticket for you. That in itself has brought a lot of unethical behavior by journalists because a hungry man is an angry man a man that cannot be himself when he goes that there to be able to do his job there's tendency that he might be able to just drop the ball so those are the part of the uh, the problem i'll say i'm also we are living in a country also uh, just like journalists are nigerians we are feeling the pace of the economy we are feeling what is going on so uh but in terms of freedom i think we've been given a, a, some free hands that have been uh, that be a situation where the government to some agencies want to get the media here and don't forget the especially with the tv station when bond come up with some um laws and some sanctions on some the broadcast stations who may broadcast and find them certain money and rest of them but all well and good i think we are still much much better than most african countries um for now the present Quickly on the nation, uh, before we move away and call it a wrap on the paper review, uh, you have Nigerian loses 5.04 trillion naira uh, annually to farmer header conflict. Is there a possibility for us to save this money? I mean, because it looks like we're losing money every other time. I think we have discussed this initially, the headers, uh, farmers conflict, uh, and I've spoken about it. Uh, before quickly going to let me let me let me talk a, a bit about um, the level of insecurity in in the southeast now. Um, since it seems not to be abating, just few days ago, um, a couple soldiers were killed and beheaded in my state of Imo. That to me is the most disturbing uh, um, act that can be performed by any. But that means that the humanity in us is gone. And I I, I hope that the security agencies, especially the army. We will do everything humanly possible to fish out the people behind that ad, where you did not only call, uh, kill the, the couple, both of them, that they went ahead this, to dismember their body and took pictures of those things and um, splashed it on social media. That to me is a terrible, it, 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 it's really horrible for me. And um, we should do everything humanly possible to make sure that those behind those ads are present. Yesterday again, we sit at home, 
um, we saw the killing in Anambra. Despite what um, new governor uh, Charles Uludo is doing to stem the issue of insecurity in Anambra state, it seems that um, the unknown government or unknown government men are still head in um, uh, making sure that uh, uh, the state remains insecure. And that brings me to the, um, to the leaders and governments of the Southeast. They have to come together. Presently, I will tell you that the Southwest is the most secured region in this country, the Southwest. And the reason for this is because of Mount Echo. Ebubagu was agreed and approved by the governors of the Southeast. Still now, they've not done anything about it. So they, when they continue to talk about insecurity, I continue to ask myself, what are they doing? Don't they see what their counterparts in the Southwest is, uh, are doing and making sure that uh, the Southwest, they can do more. And I think Charles Toledo, who is a new governor, finally ran his uh, fellow South, uh, Southeastern governors and make sure that issue of Ibubago comes to the uh, forefront and that uh, security agency should be put in place. But back to the issue of um, headers, farmers, I've said what we need to say. We need to stand the issue of insecurity across so that people can be safe to go back to the farm. If they can do that, we have enough to produce and we have enough to uh, produce. Over reliance or just good oil is not doing Nigeria any good. So every alternative we can make to be able to make money, get foreign exchange will be good for Nigeria. All right, thank you so much. Uh, Chris Kane, the Wando Chartered Mediator and Conciliator, thanks for all the thoughts you have shared on the stories that made headlines on the front pages this morning. We do appreciate your time. Thank you very much for having me. I do have a nice day ahead. All right, it's still the breakfast. Uh, we'll head off straight to what happened this day in history. And when we return, we'll be having our first conversation of the day. Stay with us.